actually, like, you can, then things can be broken down and the language can deal with everything for you, with concurrency for you. Um, and it's beautiful, but I try to write, like, possibly, possibly this is the stupidest thing to write in a functional language that I, you could think of, but I tried to write a blackjack game from the, that would take hit or stay commands from the command line and then play hands. And it kept track of decks and did all of this. The algorithms for keeping track of the deck and figuring out what cards were played were fine. Communicating with the user, so that was like 20 lines of code maybe. Just saying yes or no, I want to hit or stay. 100, 200 lines. And they were horrible and I could not understand what was going on. It took me way longer than it should have. Now some of that is just because I'm not very smart. But some of that is because it's just hard. Um, and it assumes sort of that the hard part of your program is manipulating a very fixed data structure. But it turns out, for a lot of programs, um, that is not true. Uh, Juju is a very specific example. So we talked about Juju here, but I'll just, Juju um, will deploy services for you. So it'll deploy MySQL and a database and uh, memcache and a bunch of things and then configure them all to work together. So 98% of the code in Juju is all about doing things to machines. Those things are not manipulating data structures in some classically functional program available way. They're dealing with input and output, chain, writing config files, they're doing all these things that functional programming languages are horrible at doing. Um, which turns out that is what most programs do, is stuff that functional programs are horrible. Um, question, I see both nodding and glazed over looks. <laughs> okay, so now I'll talk about how awesome Go is. Um, Go does one really useful thing. It has a primitive for doing concurrency that they tell you this is what you should use. You can use threads too, they're hiding in the back, but you shouldn't use them. Um, a, well, it has a primitive for concurrent ex execution and a primitive for communicating between those things. Um, between threads or something? Between, well, they're called Go routines. Um, yeah, so, I, I looked at a Go routine. It looks, looks like another name for a function. Well, a, um, so I'll just skip ahead and we'll come back. Um, so if you want a Go routine instead of a function, in terms of Go, what you have to do is type Go in front of the function. Um, like so, Go list sort is going to sort that list in the background. It's going to take care of it for you. And then when it's done, that list is going to be sorted. Now, you don't know when that's going to be done. So if you look at, like if you assign something to the result of Go list sort, it's not going to be there until it has sorted it. And that could take who knows how long. So you don't want to just do this and then use it. Um, so this is a terrible example because you wouldn't do this. Um, but it is the equivalent, sort of, of running something in a separate thread. It gets done in the background and you don't know when it's happening or when it's done. Um, it is happening concurrently somewhere. Um, the Go language spec says that coroutines are, quote, multiplexed across OS level threads by the language itself. Uh, there are two different compilers that are commonly used for Go. Um, the one, um, the C compiler from Google and a GCC compiler. Um, advice, do not use the GCC component. <laughs> it is missing escape analysis, so your um, program will grow in terms of memory use in an unbounded way. Um, that seems bad. Um, we use it in Juju for a few things because 
we needed Power 8 or something where the C compiler does not have a Power 8 architecture target. Um, but we are sad about that. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to make Golang better and we're trying to trying to make the Google Go, uh, the C compiler, target the things that we want to use. And we're also trying to help along um, GCC Go a little bit as well. Um, the point that I'm making about multiplex across OS level threads is you don't know, and you don't need to know, and you don't get to know how it handles it. In the C compiler, it handles it in one way. In the GCC compiler, I think, this may have changed actually, but at one point in the GCC compiler, it just meant it gets a threat. Um, but they get to make this decision, and they will figure it out how to make it best in Go, and you don't get to. Um, because you will want, say, a specific Go routine probably to run on a specific core, preferentially, and not switch between cores because now you have memory and context things and you're having latency that you don't want. But Go handles it. Um, the next primitive that I'm going to talk about is really, really important uh, and also really, really easy to use. Um, so these are channels. Channels are the way that you should communicate the results of things that happen asynchronously. Um, they can be used for other things. They are very useful. Uh, and they are first class. Go routines and channels are both first class objects in Go. You can name them things, pass them around, do things with them. Um, there are basically two kinds of channels, um, buffered and unbuffered. Uh, the buffer channel um, has a, it's like a network queue, um, but it's not a network queue. It's local to your program, but it is a queue. It is a list of things in order, and you can pull things off of it. Um, and then an unbuffered channel is a thing when you put something on it, you can't put anything else in it until somebody takes it off. It is synchronous, like. So you can both synchronize things using channels and make cues of things using channels. Yes? Your uh, buffer channel of pointers, that's a rifle uh, queue? Yes. No first, first up, no push and pop? Yes. Um, so it is just a queue, um, and you can grab things off of it. Um, and if you try and put more than 100 things in there, it'll yell at you. It won't yell at you, it'll panic. Mm -hmm. So that is unfun. Um, and then, this is totally unrelated to current concurrency, but actually the best thing about Go. <laughs> and other people are going to disagree with me and tell me that I'm wrong, but they're not correct. <laughs> the most boring thing in the world. Go format formats your code. And it just formats it, and that is the way it has to be. Like, that's just it. it that is the one true formatting of GoCo. Um, you don't have to worry about lining up. Um, if you have a list of things that you want this to be equal to this, you don't have to line them up both lists. It will do it for you. It just handles it. That's Inden the way. Indents the code you're talking about? It will indent the code. Everything. So it's a beautifier. It's, it's a pretty print for your code. But it defines the one true way to do code. Um, so it's easier to write because you don't have to worry about what is the right way. Like, am I supposed to line up both sides or am I only supposed to line up the first side of this list of things that I want to make connected to each other? You don't have to think about it. Go format will take care of it. For you. you just write it and then you type go format and it fixes your shit. Um, <laughs> the good news about that is then you're not thinking about it while you're writing code. You're just writing code. And when you read code, you don't have to think, oh, well, maybe he puts the um, the bracket on the same line, or maybe he doesn't. Where does the bracket, like, everything is just, it is a way you know how to read it is perfect. Um, and you can't argue, like, people <laughs> in Python land argue about tabs versus spaces. 
because you have to indent things. Do you use tabs or do you use spaces? You use spaces and you share. Tabs. Tabs. You use four spaces, that is the one true way. <laughs> tabs. You are incorrect. <laughs> Pep8 says you are incorrect. Yeah, you Python right. has a document that says the true way to write Python code is to use four spaces. Except if you're at Google, in which case you use two. It actually says that in the document. <laughs> <laughs> because Lido works at Google. Um, but instead of having Pep8 be just like a bunch of rules that people can argue about, it is a thing that happens. And you don't get to argue. People can say, oh, I would like it if Go Format did this instead of that. They can say that all they want. They have to convince somebody and get that shit landed in order for anything to change. So there's one source of truth, and it is a computer. And computers are maybe not smart, but they are consistent. Um, so the reason I think this is really important and this is very <laughs> idiosyncratic to me, and some of you may have heard this story. Um, but the very first thing I ever did as a professional programmer, other than write some school code for the COBOL code for the School of Dentistry when I was in high school, uh, the first thing I did as an adult programmer, um, I was a network administrator. We ran this code called Ergo Tool, um, and. They deployed it for the first time to a client who had paid $10,000 for the right to use this web-based survey software. And they found out that if two people use this website at the same time, it's totally broken. Yeah. <laughs> All of their data would be the same. by the government? <laughs> yeah, it's like, do not use, no, you cannot use, it wasn't like, oh, we'll give you errors. It's just like, you'll fill out the survey and I'll save somebody else's data. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we found out on Thursday that they had sent this out to 9,000 employees at Eli Lilly headquarters. Uh, and they all, well, had four or five different people's data. Um, but there was four or five sets of responses that were all the same 9,000 times in the database. <laughs> and so they called us it. and they said, hey, we spent $10,000 on this software. And it's pretty much the worst thing we've ever seen. Um, and we didn't really have an answer.